technical liberation, I'll put it in technical terms, for the true resolution of the national question. Or we should put it for true liberation, independence, and sovereignty of the African people in their own country. More with total liberation, you also include total control of the resources of the country. When you are talking about resolution of the national question, we are also talking about the total liberation of the culture and the languages of the people of the country. You are talking of the total liberation of the education system of that particular country. You are not talking about restitution of land to selected. You are talking about the total dominion and controllership of that country by its people, by its nation, the African people. Number two, they talk of democracy. My Africa, there are two types or more of democracy. There's what we call the electoral, thin democracy, liberal democracy, that is prevailing in this country under the liberal constitution, which you all go around the world and tell them the world that this is the best constitution we have. <laughs> that is electoral democracy, where you can recycle your rulers who rule you, oppress you, and each time after four or five years, you recycle them. That's what is called electoral democracy. But here we're dealing with substantive democracy. Substantive democracy is talking about a situation where people are in control, complete control of the conditions of their, of their life. When people have got no handles, when it comes to becoming what they want to be, where people have faced no heralds for self-respect, for dignity, etc. Where people have got control, control of the resources, of the material conditions that make their life better. That's what we mean by substantive democracy. So on one hand, we can say South Africa may be a democratic country from the liberal electoral point of departure. But it is highly undemocratic country when it comes to substantive democracy. <laughs> what then is the call upon you and me? This includes all this idea. I'm almost sure that there are people here who are not necessarily PEC, who are coming from other political parties. And I must say, you are also welcome. But I must say that join us in the fight for substantive democracy. Yes. In 1952, Ntubim was heading the Transvaal African Teacher Association. And they passed a resolution it's important to know, given what Africa had alluded to. In that resolution, it was for a universal free education. That's what it intervened in 1952. The free education called by the students today merely represents the continuing cry. Yes. Yes. May I also say to you, my Africa, the issue is not free education. The issue, as I've already said, is there being issue of substantive democracy in this country. Two, the issue is fight against poverty, inequality, etc. That is the issue. Let's start it from there. Because when students say we are children of the working class who are coming from poor people, what are they talking about? 
They are talking about the poverty of the African people. They can translate that aspect of poverty as it resonates itself via access to education. But substantively speaking, the issue is poverty inequality that exists in this country unabated. <laughs> so the struggle of the student must be understood from the point of view of fight against inequality, fight against inequality and poverty in this country. I'll come back to that in the industry. So understand it from that point of view. That's what is meant by the three. I'll come back to that. So that was the issue of the resolution of the, of the national question. Secondly, the issue was the unity <coughs> of the African people in this continent. Now, let me emphasize one thing here. We are not talking about the unity of the heads of states. We are not talking about the unity of the heads of state meeting now and again, here and there again, in an AU which they cannot even want to finance. I don't know even if you are aware of Africa that about 70% or more of the AU activities are financed through aid money, not through subscription by the African state. Yeah. We have an institution which we are so proud about, but we can hardly finance it ourselves. <laughs> now, we won't know, we don't have to be stupid now to forget that those that are financing the AU will finance it because they have got their own agenda. Yeah. Yeah. Furthermore, what in today we're talking about was people's to people's unity. <laughs> not state of states, people to people unity. Where the people of this part of the world can be united with their neighbors, etc. Because, my African, do not forget, our current state or nation state, I normally call them state nations, like South Africa, but simply bow in the like everybody else, our current nation state's boundaries were not drawn by us, the African people. It is for that reason that we found that our borders relatives being this side of the nation state and other relatives the other side of the nation state. How can that nation state be complete when part of its people are this side of another nation state? Never. Have we ever asked that question? There are more Sutus in South Africa than in the Sutu. <laughs> but the Sutu is a nation state. And South Africa is a nation state. And we can deal with the same thing with regard to Mozambique, Southland, and other places. So the history here in Africa doesn't brought it into big deal about. The unity of the African people. Not the hate of state. We have what we call border languages. Why are we having border languages? By that I mean, we find the same language spoken this side of the border, and I have the same language speaking the other side of the border. And that tells you, in no uncertain terms, that the same people have been divided. One professor was speaking in one of the programs here, at other country in West Africa, where he said, there is a house in one of the countries Half of it is in one state, the other half is in another state. And this is not what the African leaders are addressing. They are addressing so-called peace services, peace keeping what? Peace keeping. When in fact it is known that this means they are looking for natural resources of those countries. You send your soldiers for peacekeeping in DRC or in Central African Republic. They are not only sending them there for peacekeeping. It's because when they move there, the elites of this country follow them to go and look for diamonds. Woo! 
That is the reality of Africa. That is the reality. And that reality was not what our colleagues were about. May I therefore say, this is what the two things, the software and the like, had hoped would happen with liberation. But what is happening today? What is happening today? To start with, the social order. When we talk about the social order, we're talking about the economy, the social life, the cultural life, the institutional life, etc. of the people in that particular society. That's what we talk the social order. The social order that exists today is a social order that says those that were oppressed at other time remain where they are. And those that were rulers at the time remain rulers. Remember, and this was clear, the wars failed that um, it was rather too exacting them to continue controlling these unruly Africans. Why can't we send fellow Africans to manage these unruly Africans so that we can retain our control of the resources? Get 
the better life in their continent of Africa. They have to go to Europe, to the former colonizers, to go and back for better life. But we put our African leaders meeting pompously, saying that there is progress. The unfortunate thing is, the poor from country A cross over to country B and start contesting the crumbs that are there between themselves and those that are in that country. We then have what you call in South Africa, what you call, you not people, what you call in South Africa xenophobia. When the struggle here is the poor from outside contesting little resources with the poor in this country. The only thing that the African PAC people, you must take note, have not done is to make the African people here and outside that they have a common enemy. That common enemy are the leaders of Africa today. Instead of fighting and killing each other, they should be forming unity, people's unity, against the rulers, the troubled niggers in this country. When we now talk of Pan-Africanism, Mutupeng and Sobube has said, the continent of Africa has got immense resources, which when they are systematically planned and deployed, will fight against poverty, etc. of the African people. Sobube went on and said, the world is breaking through scientific knowledge and new technology. And he asked the question, whether South Africa in other words, they were calling upon that Africa must join the science and technological world advancement. Tum to be poverty, African, African people were not acceptable. Let me briefly indicate to him, for instance, what he said. One, he said the African people have developed the capacity to, to craft their own program of liberation under their own terms to realize their own goals. Secondly, he said we are truly socialist, but we accept the fact that the implementation and introduction of socialism in our country would be worked upon by the people of this country with their government. But crucial in the socialism is that we declare war against the poverty and exploitation of one group of people by the other. That is the litmus test. There should be and shall be no exploitation of one group by the other, of one individual by the other. The work of the country, almost totally, you'll find it in the paper much more defined, should be well distributed to all the African people. That was their position. Again, when you ask ourselves what's the position today? What's the position today? May I then go on and say, we now talk of racism. Personally, when that white lady was calling us monkeys for being on the beach, I said, oh, I'm lucky, I'm a monkey, I have my beach in my country. <laughs> then I said to my Africa, how? My Africa, I need it. We normally say sometimes, Wola and Jayami. Why can't we say, Wola and Kawiyami? Why can't we say, Wola and <laughs> What I'm trying to say in Africa is that, one, <laughs> you can only, <laughs> racist will only be on you so long you allow them to be on you. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. So long you allow them to you. Yeah. So long you 
let's begin to scream.
through the national system. Therefore, it's not free for the country. And why is education not a commodity? It's because in economies we call it a public good. In other ways, the benefits are not just for the individual who has gone to school. The benefits are for the community, Makilani, Umama, and the nation as a whole. There are therefore a lot of what are called the spillover. And that is why we call it a public good. When I consume education, I don't exclude you. When I'm going to school, I'm not excluding you. The more education I get, it's not a question of the less education you can get. No, when something is of that characteristic, we call it a public good. So education, what the government must declare and declare unreservedly is that education is not a commodity in this country. As to at what point they will fully fund it is a different point that we can, we can debate. Let me give you an example. The education portfolio in this country is handled by 13 political individuals, ministers. The education portfolio in South Africa is handled by 13 political ministers. There are four at national level and nine. How can a portfolio, one portfolio, be handled by 30? Who else was Secondly, ask yourself, how much money is spent in maintaining those 30 ministries? Okay. Then we are going to be told there is no money. We are going to be told there is no money. Education, that is education with education. Crime and violence are often the same. South Africa is a violence. Violence is, is defined by the existence of one group being oppressed and dominated by other groups, and that group reacting. That condition we call it violence. Mm. It is only called crime because there is a legal statutes that define that action as crime. Mm. What we're dealing with there from Africa fundamentally is violent. <laughs> Not just what the penal code calls crime. <laughs> what we're dealing with, we're dealing with more than what the penal code deals with. We're dealing with violence. South Africa is the violence. We normally would say a society with social order creates a condition where the energies of the people, instead of being directed constructively for their own development, are blocked. And having been blocked, they turn against the same people. We call this country a structurally violent country. And South Africa is a structurally violent country. Thank you. Much more better than 
sometimes in areas now than the private sector. The private, the public sector in South Africa, to call it, is one of the best paid public sector in the world. If I were to tell you that like last year or two years ago, President Zuma was paid to higher than the Prime Minister of England, the German yes? Yes. So the, the captain of industry say, why should we invest for purposes of this guy transferring this money and pocketing it? We are not going to invest. They are on an investment strike. So no amount of trips that you are going to have going abroad will help you to bring anybody with some money there. Let me go further and say, we are under what is normally called structural adjustment problem, driven by the IMF and the World Bank. Marvin, let me tell you, the IMF and the World Bank is seated behind the office of finance. They are directing the terms, do it this way, that way, that way. So, the rates that you are talking about are already telling you you can't pay for education that level because it won't be good for. We are under structural adjustment. Those that are working in government are aware that less departments are being restructured and reduced in size. We are going to see very soon less money is going to be available for these uh, welfare programs because under structural adjustment, what happened? At independence, all countries in Africa had so much resources, but they had squandered. Squander. When this guy realizes you squandered your resources, start imposing conditions on you. That's where we are now. We squandered all the resources. Now we must pay through being told what to do. We have lost for Africa our decrease of freedom to make economic policies. We no longer have that. Yeah. 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 President Zuma and his cabinet and ourselves as people can no longer determine who should be the Minister of Finance. Yeah. Yeah. These people are already telling you, if it's not Prophet Gordon, then you're in trouble. The currency is going to go down. This is going to be, and then we stupidly we said, hey, don't do it, don't do it. Just keep this guy. Just keep this guy. The nation, the nation has been held on the ransom. We are being told that if you kick him out, you are in trouble. And all of us now we rally. We support him. We support him. And he, he takes papers to, to court. He says. Can you prevent me from doing what I'm supposed to do as a minister? May, may I repeat this? Yeah. Prophet Gordon goes to court. He says, I'm asking the court to prevent me to do what I'm supposed to do as a minister. Why? That's, that's the meaning of the papers wow. submitted last week. Because what he's asking not, not to do is what he's supposed to do. But he wants the court to declare him not to do it. So that tomorrow you will say, I could not do it because the court has declared I should not do it. My Africa, where is Ibrahim Patel? Where is Tindiwe uh, Zulu? Where is Rob Davis? I thought those people were in economics. I thought Prabhu Kojin was dealing with finance. But everything about the economy of this country is now under the hands of Prabhu Kojin. He is now the Minister of Economic Affairs. And that is happening before your eyes. And damn it, you are quiet. It is happening before our eyes. Both the ruling parties and the non ruling parties are quiet. That's why the Communist Party is very uneasy. Patel, their member, has been given a leave, a paid leave. 
You have never heard him talk about economic issues? The little girl in the way got in there with so much bravado, small business, I don't know what he meant by small business, assuming she knew. We don't know, we don't hear where she is now. Rob Davis is no longer there in trade and industry. Who is running the economy of the country, Rob and God Davis? Now ask yourself, why is it so? It is because the IMF and the World Bank are dictating like that. That, that, that's where we are. Finally, Africa. The Trousbat niggers, working with their fellow white elites, are aware that we are going into serious problems, that the country is sinking. May I repeat? They are fully aware that the country is thinking. Like it was done in biblical times. That is why they are already constructed their Noah's Ark. Sure. They are going to be together with their families and henchmen, they are all going to get into that ark. And they shall remain floating when the rest of us will be drowning in poverty and violence. Amen. Amen. They shall remain floating until the dove will come with a leaf to tell them they are all dead and now come out. That's what happened. My Africa, what happened in the Titanic disaster, I'm sure you remember it. The people that survived the Titanic disaster were the first class passengers who were on the upper deck. Do you know why they survived? For two reasons. First, the announcement of the disaster was made at the upper deck. So they had first that the ship was sinking. Secondly, the lifeboats were nearer the upper deck. So they were the first to escape using the lifeboats. Those that were second class in the beginning and down, they had the message of disaster late. That's why the African people here are pretty ignorant about what is happening. And lastly, they had no access to lifeboats. They must come forward, working with the people of this country, one more time to find the new page of the new struggle for, democr uh, for substantive democracy in this country. For true public democracy. We are calling upon the African Americans to work together with other Africanists in the continent of Africa to, show, to, to ensure that people to people, unity and development is achieved. Yeah. It is your responsibility to, to do that. We are calling upon you to rekindle African nationalism. And don't be afraid by the leftist internationalists. You can be an internationalist. You can't start being internationalist because before you are a nationalist. The nationalist is a precondition. So don't be afraid. But at the same time, Africa is important now that as we move forward in our African nationalism and Africanism, we must not close our eyes about the class issue. Among ourselves, there are those that are well better off. There are those that are exploiting other people among ourselves. So we, we have to take a class-oriented nationalism. A class-oriented nationalism that ensures that equality, there's no exploitation of one person by the other. Equal distribution of wealth, social justice prevails for all. That should be our holding point. But we must ignite the nation. We must stop the nation being turned into children, what we call the infantilization of the people by the ruling party. You are children. We are treated like children. Why do we treat you like children? Because we liberated you. I think the case is justified. 
You can't expect me to liberate you, then tomorrow you consider yourself to be my equal. Yes. I liberated you. Yes. You must listen to me. Yeah. I dictate what you should do because I liberated you. All the struggles that was done by the people in this country, all of them, men and women, children and etc., have been reduced into we liberated you. When we talk about the people who liberated us, let me end up by saying we have got statues that have been built up in this country. And it is accolading those that struggled. Where is the pioneer in being statues? from the city show back. We can ask the same question, my sister. Where is that station? We have got Manhattan Gandhi station. <laughs> Let me tell you briefly. Let me tell you briefly what Gandhi said about us. Yeah. When a law was passed in what was called the British colony in the Cape. That was uh, preventing people from moving from point A to point B. Gandhi said, I can understand when this law is applied to the Kepas, but it cannot be applied to us. In the when he was uh, addressing a meeting in Bombay, he said, our greatest problem in South Africa is that the Europeans want to club us with these kefirs and make us to be equal to them. Somewhere here in Joburg, there was a, a township area where the Africans and Indians were supposed to be going together, uh, live side by side. Gandhi objected to the city mayor and he just said, on what grounds can you put the Kepas next to the Indians? So throughout Gandhi, we were Kepas to him. But we are told that that's a guy we must honor for one of our liberators. We are told we must have the statuary. You got the details in the paper. So the Tarzan niggers have not only misbehave, they've also lied, and they lied deeply, I thank you.